We're going to look at passages in both Luke chapter 1 and 2 and also in Matthew chapter 1 and chapter 2. If you want to go to those locations and be able to hold that place in the scripture, it's a familiar story. It's the Christmas story. I know it's the the week after Christmas. This whole message has had an interesting sort of history. Very early in the Christmas season, Carrie and I were talking one night and we were just reflecting on Christmas and she was, she was pointing out, she had been reading the Christmas story and she said, look, have you ever noticed how many people in the Christmas story get told something and get told to go do something and they have to make that faith decision to go? And of course, we spent the entire fall um, publicly as a group, the staff, we've been working on it since last January, over a year ago, with the whole let's go theme, the, the idea of going deeper, the idea of living intentionally, the idea of reaching further in our faith and on our ministry and our activities as a church. And so we've been living with let's go all fall in a very public way, the message series and everything related to that, and asking God, this is what you're asking us to do. This is where you're telling us to go, and, uh, and it's time for us to go. And so as we reflected on it, as we talked about it, it seemed like a really good idea. We would come out of all the special services. We got a couple of weeks before we start the next message series in the book of Acts, and, and we would just look at the people in the Christmas story and the call, the the moments when they're told, I want you to go do this. I want you to participate in this. And kind of a a little sort of mini two weeks of let's go and seeing people who are real people in the most amazing story throughout all of history, obviously contained in our scripture. Seemed like a great idea. A couple of days later, I'm washing dishes, and as I'm washing the dishes, I look down, and it was kind of like the Red Sea, the, the suds parted. And there was a bright red mug that a friend had given us, and on the top of the mug, it said, let's go. So I took that as a sign that God was saying, the church needs to hear this message. You need to think about it, contemplate it, study it, and be prepared to share it with them on New Year's Eve. Everything was put in motion. The team all knew what was taking place and what was happening, and it was all good. So we have a chaplain ministry that ministers to retirement centers and nursing homes and skilled nursing centers and locations. And we were there this past week, and I was there as a part of the Christmas season and everything, and I thought, what the heck? I don't need to prepare two messages I would just share with everybody who's there, except for a few exceptions of those who join us on live stream, they won't, they won't be able to be with us Sunday, and so they'll hear the message, and I'll have the opportunity to teach it before I teach it to you. Except that when I announced that I wanted them to turn, and we were going to look at the Christmas story one last time, you need to understand the demographic in that location. If they think it, they say it. And they thought it and rejected the idea of having a Christmas message the week after Christmas. I was told straight out, Christmas is over. So I didn't know what else to do. The only other verse I had studied that day because we were kind of off this past week and we were taking some time for ourselves as a staff was the verse of the day. And so I just real quickly switched to Psalms 70 and said, let's look at this verse of scripture and let's talk about this. One of the workers told me this morning they thought it was a really good message and that they were amazed with no preparation. I went on for 35 or 40 minutes. So I come home Wednesday night. This, the, the story is not over yet. And I tell Carrie what happens when I was at the retirement center. And she goes, oh, my gosh. What if the church does that? What if, what if you announce Sunday morning, we're going to look at the Christmas story one last time, kind of from a different perspective, and the church says, no. I'm not going to ask for a vote but I'm going to ask for your patience one last time as we look at Matthew and we look at Luke and we look at those first couple of chapters in both Gospels and we look at the moments 
when people are asked by God to do something that honestly isn't an easy task. It's not, a, it's not an easy decision. It's not, a, it's not one of those moments when you think in, to yourself, oh, this makes sense, or I'm going to be so blessed by this or this. And, and it's one of those moments when you have to contemplate, pray, and make a faith decision to do something extraordinary, something out of the norm, and something that may even cost you. We're going to look at those stories today specifically with Mary and with Joseph. And it's not so much Christmas as much as it is the moment God asks us to do something. Because I believe our relationship with God is extremely dynamic, and I believe he is always moving, he's always working, and I believe he's always asking us, he's always directing us, he's, he's always wanting us to do something, because that helps us grow, and I made that challenge, so that's the other part. You were supposed to get this message Christmas Eve, but um, our children's message went a little bit long, and we ran out of time Christmas Eve. I know what you're thinking. Maybe this message was never supposed to be taught. In about 15 minutes, we'll be able to make a definitive decision on that. So not so much Christmas, but so much more in terms of the call that the gift of Christmas and the gift of having a personal relationship, and I did make that challenge Christmas Eve, that growth and maturity that stretches us and moves us when we have to make decisions that in a very real sense, the only operating paradigm we have is one of faith. One of faith that says, just like we sang, great is God's faithfulness, great, great is God's faithfulness throughout all of my life. Since I've known him, he's always been faithful. After I met him, I've learned that he was faithful even when I rejected him. He continued to love me, continued to invite me, continued to want to have a relationship with me. And now, now that I know him and now that I'm in this relationship with him, he continues to stretch and challenge and call me out of my comfort zone to serve him so that I benefit and grow and mature and so that his work gets accomplished. And we have the opportunity to be invited in to the activity of God. So the first one, probably not a real surprise, is Mary in Luke chapter 1. And again, you'll be familiar with this, but if you want to look at it in the scripture with me, I'm going to highlight a couple of things. It's a moment that changes history. In verse 26, it says that the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin engaged or betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Alternate translations would summarize that as, Blessed are you among women. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Then the angel told her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. Now I'm assuming just about everybody in this room, and I'm assuming everybody on live stream is familiar with with this story. You've heard it, you've heard it read. It's not the primary part of what we call the Christmas story when we look at the Gospel of Luke, when we read it together with the kids as we did Christmas Eve, but it is the precursor, the prequel, so to speak, when Mary is going to find out in the presence of an angel that she will become pregnant And she will carry a child full term into birth and then nurture and love him and care for him. And that child is the very son of God. In my opinion, it's somewhat incomprehensible. How, How can this possibly be? And that's why I love it when in verse 34... Mary's response, she asked the angel, how can this be? 
And just to clarify, in case the angel isn't aware of her behavior, she flat out says, she looks at the angel, she looks at Gabriel and says, look, I've not had sex with anybody. This is physically impossible. Gabriel explains the Holy Spirit is going to do a work here that is supernatural, fulfills prophecy, and he's chosen you as the instrument by which this miracle will take place, ultimately the instrument by which the entire world will have the opportunity for forgiveness and a relationship with God. By this God-man, this Son of God, coming and being with his people and living amongst them. If it's incomprehensible for me 2,000 years later as a believer, then what must it have been like in that moment when Gabriel appears, he calms her down, he tells her not to be afraid, which is just the peace before the storm. Sometimes I think we tend to focus literally that the angel was a frightening appearance, which it would be. Nothing really sweet about angels in the biblical definition of angels. It would be frightening. But I think it's a precursor to the entire event. Do not be afraid. The source of that lack of fear is that you have found favor. God loves you. God desires and wants to work through you. And this is what he's going to do. We can't judge Mary very hard for saying, how can this be? How can this happen? How many times, if we stop for a moment just to remember it, at the conclusion of a year and the introduction into a new year, would we have to stop and say, there have been times in my life when God asked me to do something, when God directed me to accomplish something or to go somewhere or to do something in some form or fashion, and I knew it was from him, but it made no sense. If we're going to go in faith... We have to do it in spite of the fact that we don't understand or we don't comprehend. Mary's final response is all the way down in verse 38 when she says, look, I I am the Lord's servant. May it happen to me as you have said. And Gabriel leaves her. We will be called in our faith at different points in our lives, and it may happen in 2024, to do things that God requests of us, asks us, directs us, whether it is through the impression of the Holy Spirit in our heart and in our life, whether it is through the counsel of Scripture and reading it and studying it, or whether it is through the counsel of close godly friends that we gather with to study the Scripture and to worship together. That's one of the key essentials to being a part of a church is that we have people that God can use to help direct us and guide us. And we may not understand. We may not comprehend. It may not make sense. But we need to go anyway. It's the simple priority of if he says this is what we should do, we should do it. And it's not always going to make sense. The timeline's a little unclear, but in Matthew chapter 1, in a completely different gospel, in a completely different historical account of these events, we find the other half of this scenario. We find Joseph now. This is afterwards because Joseph is now aware. It tells us in verse 18, this is the way the birth of Jesus came about. His mother Mary had been engaged and betrothed to Joseph. It was discovered before they came together, before their marriage, that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. And Joseph follows the parameters and the ideas and the concepts and the teaching of the current trends in society, wanting to do it as a gentleman, wanting not to disgrace her in any way, but makes the decision. And their engagements were much different than our engagements. I know you've already heard this. Essentially, an engagement was the first phase of marriage. You had to legally, technically divorce if you were engaged, even though you hadn't been married yet. And so Joseph makes the decision. That's the best thing I can do. I don't want to disgrace Mary. I don't want to harm her. I love her, but she's pregnant. 
and I've not been with her. And so my best option is to divorce. An angel shows up again in verse 20 in the midst of his dream and says to Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Everything proper in Joseph's life tells him which path he should take, tells him which direction he should go, which decision he should make, except an angel appears to him again and speaks to him and speaks to his mind and his heart and says, this is what you should do. This is what God wants you to do, Joseph. There will be times in our faith journey that we will be called to do something, go somewhere, accomplish something, represent the Lord in some form or fashion, and it will be contrary to local current trends. It'll be contrary to social influencers. It'll be contrary to culture. It will not fit into political correctness. It will not fit into your well-laid, well-devised plans. And we'll have to, like Joseph, make a decision. Am I willing to go even though nobody who knows me will agree with this decision? Nobody who knows me will support this decision. And, you know, and it just simply says um, down in verse 24 that when Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. And he married her, and they didn't have any sex until after they gave birth to the, until after she gave birth to his son. And he did exactly as the angel told him to do, named the child Jesus. Can you imagine having that conversation with your parents? Hey, mom. Hey, dad. I know you agreed that I need to divorce Mary. And I know you're not happy about what's taking place. And I know we can't explain. And I know we don't have an adequate answer as to why she's pregnant. And I haven't been with her. I, I don't have a good explanation for this. But I had a dream. I mean, do you remember your childhood enough to know what that would feel like? Mom and Dad, I want you to potentially destroy our family name ruin our reputation in the community, and do everything the opposite of the trending polls on TikTok, and I want to marry her anyway. Oh, and here's a catch, Mom. Your grandson is the Son of God, and he's going to save the whole world from their sins. How do I know this? Because I had this dream, and this angel showed up in my dream. If there was ever a lack of information and a sketchy reason to do something everybody disagreed with, it's Joseph's decision. But Joseph believed. See, we, we read this stuff looking at the past, knowing the truth. To us, Joseph's decision makes sense. What else would he do? He's about to be the stepfather of the Son of God. The entire world's going to receive forgiveness by his son that he will influence and raise. Of course Joseph would do this. This is an amazing thing. That's looking back 2,000 years. If you're that afternoon after Joseph woke up from his nap and went back to his parents' house and said, hey, you know what? I took a nap right after I was working this morning. It was really hot today and construction was tough and... I just took a nap, and while I was there at the construction site, I had that nap, and I've decided I'm going to go ahead and do this, even though all of you disagree. If God calls us, are we willing to do something, even if it's so contrary to popular opinion, we potentially even lose those relationships? I understand this. When I made the decision to become a Christian, it negatively influenced a lot of people. 
I remember that spring making that decision to trust Jesus. I knew God confirmed it. I was no doubt in my mind. My life had been changed. I had no clue where it was going or what it was going to do, but I knew I would never be the same person because I had met Jesus. And I went home and my closest friend in high school, we got together, we were going to go eat lunch. And I sat across the table and I was so excited and I was so thrilled. And I looked at him and I said, I've met Jesus. And he just kind of gave me this look like, yeah, it's not the first time I've heard you talk crazy. I said, no, I really met God. And it's only been a couple of weeks, but he's already changed my life. And it's nothing, I can't go back. And he questioned for a long period of time throughout that lunch, my decision, how insane it sounded to him, how much I was going to miss out on. I, it has only been a couple of weeks, and I already knew somehow that meeting God was going to change the entire direction of my life, career, everything that I was motivated to accomplish wasn't going to happen in that way. I knew it was changing everything, and he just couldn't understand. And I remember in many ways as if it happened yesterday, standing in front of my parents' house because I'd gone back to try to work on that relationship with them and redeem that in the same way that I had seen God forgive me. Um, I stand in front of my house and he had dropped me off and he looked at me and he said, James, almost said what he said back then, but then you all start calling me that. James, if this is the decision, this is our last conversation. I will never see you again. I tried over the years to call, tried to follow him in college. I'm not on social media, as all of you know, so I couldn't go any of those pathways. But truer words, he never spoke. To this day, he never spoke to me again. We never had another conversation. He rejected everything about the most important decision I had ever made. But like Joseph, I had to have that faith experience and say, you know what? If this is what God wants me to do, then my responsibility is to wake up and to do it. Sometimes it's not going to make sense. Sometimes it's going to be difficult to understand. Sometimes it's going to go against popular opinion, but we need to go. And it may be inconvenient and hardship. The Christmas story we're most familiar with describes that. How inconvenient it was for Joseph and Mary to go to Bethlehem. How hard it was to find that there was no place for them to stay. How difficult it was for her to give birth in a stable it was inconvenient, and it was hard, but they did it anyway. Probably the least read part of the Christmas narratives is the very last part in Matthew chapter 2, and verse 13. After they were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph again in a dream, saying, get up, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I tell you. He gives an explanation for Herod is about to search for the child to kill him. Joseph's response, so he got up in verse 14, took the child and his mother during the night and escaped to Egypt. He stayed there until Herod's death so that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet would be fulfilled out of Egypt. I called my son. Probably the least favorable part of the Christmas story that we tend to overlook. We strategically did it Christmas Eve. We knew all the kids were up here. And Christy said, you want me to go that far? And I said, no, we don't need to try to explain genocide to our children on Christmas Eve. Just Herod was a bad guy, and we'll wait till they're in the youth group to try to explain that. Sometime doing what God wants you to do is hazardous, and it has risk. They left their home together, gave birth to the child while traveling. And then after having given birth to the child, before they get to go back home is the way the timeline appears to me, 
They are told, you, you need to leave. And you don't only need to leave your home, you need to leave your country, you need to leave your nation, you need to leave your family, you need to leave your friends, you need to leave your career, you need to leave your occupation, and you need to go to Egypt, which by the way, not in a prejudicial statement, but in just the facts of history, Jews never wanted to go back to Egypt, ever. Why would you want to go back to the place of your slavery? Why would you want to go back to the place of the mass killing of your relatives and family and nationality and ethnicity? What, who wants to go back to Egypt? Just to fulfill a little tiny prophecy that I'm guessing the vast majority of us in here, unless you looked at the footnote real quick, don't even know the reference to where that prophecy that out of Egypt I will call my son is coming from. But for that, Joseph and Mary and Jesus left everything and went without a return ticket, without a return date. Nowhere on their planner does it say, oh, and by the way, you're going to move back to Nazareth on this date. You just have this issue from the, from the angel. Go, and when I'm ready for you to come back, I'll tell you. This may be the hardest one of all for us to absorb. Imagine God asking us to do something that was that risky, that hazardous, and that indefinite in its direction. Go and go to this place. And Joseph and Mary and Jesus did. Turns out the gift of Christmas that we've celebrated all season long has a pretty storied and difficult path to come to the joy that we have sung about and the peace that we have longed for and the blessing that we have experienced. Sometimes faith will ask us to do something that doesn't make any sense. It will ask us to go somewhere that is contrary to popular opinion. It will ask us to do something that's inconvenient and even just simply difficult. And then sometimes even hazardous or risky. Will we go? There would be a lot of times I would be in the middle of a message like this, and there would be a part of me looking towards a new year that that question would loom longer and bigger and more difficult than the answer. Because I don't necessarily know. We, we make these decisions individually to live by faith. And then we individually come together as a body to come together with a corporate or unified decision together. And it's not easy. And it's not always done in obedience. And it's not always done with that willingness to go. But I've come out of this Christmas with a whole new perspective on the phrase, let's go. Because right here in this room, I come in here every week and there are signatures and there are scriptures and there are quotes, and there are pictures from a group of people that said, if this is what God wants us to do, we're going to do it. And so I know this year, this congregation is willing to go. Because everybody came together in one of the most unified and sweetest services I've ever participated in and said, Let's go. 
Today is December 31st, and I don't usually make statements quite this strong. But if you are with us, and you have not filled out one of these pledge cards, a simple pledge card that just ask for your name and ask for a faith decision to support the ministry of this church in a unique way to relocate because people, many of us didn't even know, determined years ago that that was what God wanted us to do. Many of us who have later adopted and become a part of that heritage have now said, yes, we believe that's what God wants us to do. And it's going to require sacrifice and commitment on our parts. If your name is not on this board, I want to challenge you in the last hours of 2023 to change that this morning. The markers are here. Right on top of an offering box if you want to put your commitment card in it. You can sign it. You can put your verse. You can draw pictures. But we have responded already as a congregation and said, we're going to go. I'm just telling you as your pastor, I want all of us to go. All of us. This is a family project, not an individual's. It's not my vision, it's not any one person's vision. It's a family vision that's over 20 years old. Construction began this past week. If you've driven by, you've seen the silt fence and you've seen the riprap and the, the, the construction entrance prepared. We're just waiting on the final technicality of one signature on a permit. The bulldozers are on the trailers, ready to roll. We're going. But I'm going to be honest with you, from the depth of my heart, as your pastor, I don't want to leave anybody behind. That decision's out of my control. So I'm just going to do the only thing I know to do and say, please, if you haven't joined us, join us. If you're not sure an amount, I'm, I'm not really as worried about the amount because I always believed from the beginning God would provide for us. I am thankful he provides through us. Gives us the opportunity to once again, like Mary, like Joseph, to be the instruments of the way he wants to touch the world. I'm grateful for that. But I don't want to leave anybody behind. So please, even if you don't know the amount... Make the commitment today because tomorrow is a new day and a new year.